pretty good. All right. Thank you, Clyde. So hello, everyone. My name is Alexi. I'm a product manager here at Product People. Very happy to be here with you guys uh, tonight. Here with me tonight, helping me on the technical side, on the Zoom magic is Clyde. Um, so I'll be the host for tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, just a few words, quick words about Product People, what we do. Um, <laughs> so like, we like to say we have, we're doing some uh, we are the hands-on on the unglamorous work of product people, of product manager, product owner. So we're doing some some product management interim interim work uh, all around Germany, and hopefully maybe sometimes France, Spain, wherever in Europe. We also have some project in in, in Switzerland. So we basically um, are ready to jump on any project if um, a company needs us, maybe from MVP or or even product strategy or, or any other things. So we work with, um, as you can see, several companies and we're not only a consultancy company, but we're also a, a community builder. And that's why we're having this events every, every Tuesday. So you can find us on a meetup page, um, product management people. So that says every Tuesday, sometimes even Thursday you have an event. So feel free to, to tag along and, and join us. We have a Telegram chat. You also feel free to join it. We always have some some discussion in this in this chat. So if you have any questions, a job offer, whatever, feel free to come and, and share with us. And we're also on Patreon, so these events are free. Um, every little bit that adds up. So feel free to to help us run the event because it's we also um, also need you. So today we're uh, I'm super happy to have Tom with us. I'm going to stop sharing for a while. Up. Um, we have Tom with us, very happy to, to have him, and he prepares um, a good talk on Figma <laughs> um, about, um, sorry, I have some problem with the sharing stuff. Hold on, yeah. So we're happy to have Tom from the, the Trigger Management Group uh, tonight with us, and I will, I will let you the, the mic. Cool, thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, Alexi, it's a real pleasure to be here and share this. This is, uh, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, this is an idea. It's something that I've been uh, working on for, well, I think this is a culmination of 20 years or so of, of working in design, research and product. Uh, and it's something I'm, I'm particularly excited to share because I think it finally solved something that was beating my head against for a very long time. Um, so let's see if I can make this behave. There we go. Uh, it's the, the idea I'm about to share has been described by Jared Spool in a very nice way. And also uh, some people who've tried it have uh, said nice things too. So it seems to be working beyond just the, the team where I Sort of formed this idea and, and the team where we worked it out together. Um, so who am I? Uh, I should give a little bit of an intro. Uh, so my name's Tom. Uh, I've been a designer and a UX researcher for about 20 years. I was, uh, I, I read Jacob Nielsen's book, Designing Web Usability in 1999 and ran my first usability tests. And it's been downhill since there. I've always been, um, certain that uh, research and design could do a better job of, of making better decisions uh, and it's always been hard to actually get there and, and one of the things that's really hard is getting uh, iteration to happen getting discovery to happen really well with lots of different companies and I've built continuous discovery programs with a couple of companies and yet there were still there were still challenges still things that, that weren't working out and we still kept seeming to do things that didn't work and I could never quite figure out why. Um, so there's a little bit of a backstory of me. Uh, there's quite a lot to this and I've written about it before and I've worked with several teams using this, uh, using this idea of pivot triggers. But uh, today I'm gonna share some of the, the basic ideas and we're gonna take us through, firstly, what goes wrong in digital product work in my view today, a lot of the time. Um, and then how I've tried and failed to fix this for 10 years, probably. Uh, why I was wrong all the time while I was trying to fix it. And then something that I stumbled on last year that finally worked. And then I'm going to share some ideas for how to try this with your teams. Um, so 
you can see details for getting more information at the bottom. Um, but let's jump straight in. So we'll start with what goes wrong in digital product back. And the default tends to be this sort of belief. If we build it, they will come. And we have someone in the company has an idea and then there's a plan and we're going to build it. And we're going to launch it and everyone's there's going to be celebrations and everyone's going to be happy. Well, I think we've probably most of us have been on projects that were like this or products that were planned like this. And it goes something like this. So we, we get going. It's great. We're building. That's fine. But then oh, there's a delay and something's a bit more complicated than we thought. So we push back the launch. But now the team have to go and do something else. So we change the team and it gets delayed again. And then finally we launch and everyone's really happy. But did it actually work? Often the answer is no. And I think um, the, the, the general understanding I have is that something like 80% of products and features fail to, to deliver the outcomes that they were supposed to deliver, which is pretty bad odds. Now, what's even worse? There was one memorable project which uh, really sticks in my memory where we knew back here in the plan, but in the, in the build process, that it was doomed. It was not going to work. Um, I could go into more detail, but I won't to protect the innocent, um, the, the guilty rather. Uh, so we, we knew back then it was going to fail, and yet it carried on. And this went on for six months. Someone from the same company who I talked, uh, who was on another, an earlier version of this talk, uh, said, only six months. The one he was thinking of from that company was two years. And uh, the same thing. We knew it was going to fail from the start, and yet we carried on. I call these things zombie initiatives. They're marching on, shambling on, even though they really are dead, dead man walking. So I think there is a, uh, there's a, the ability to jump into the chat. So if you could just jump in there and tell me what's the, what's the longest zombie initiative that you've been involved with? Of course, the chat has now disappeared for me. Adam. Two years, year and a half. Yeah, this I think is, is quite common. Um, so, very good. So, I was frustrated with this. Or oh, a massive reporting revamp ongoing for a year before I left. Multiple years. One zombie, two and a half years. Yeah. So, I think it's it, this is something that we tend to be fairly familiar with. Um, I was frustrated with this from very early on when I saw this happen over and over. And when I experienced it, I think once you've experienced it, you want to stop it from happening. And so for many years, I thought research and, and outcomes over outputs would be the way to do it. Research, if we do research, if we do A-B testing, if we prove with, with data and evidence and facts, then we'll be able to kill these zombie initiatives. And finally, that'll be the answer. And I thought, I thought this, I thought, yes. Using research and testing, I can help teams to stop building the wrong thing and stop building the thing wrong. And everything's going to be so much better. Uh, I was young and innocent and I didn't have my grizzled uh, salt and pepper beard. Uh, and I was also completely wrong. Why was I wrong? Well, as one product manager that I was working with at an older company uh, said, the problem with the research is that it tells us that we're either building the wrong thing or building the thing wrong. And I was like, what? That, that's a problem? You, you like setting fire to piles of money? But it turns out that actually I was the one who was wrong. And we can go into this. I, I was wrong because this is the world that the product manager was living in. And they were seeing really that building the product was an investment and the return was going to happen. And we just have to, we have to keep doing that investment. And then here comes me, researcher, happily coming along and saying, no, research says no, this isn't going to work. In that moment, we have changed the entire perception in the company of that all of that work to cost. So I'd suddenly cost them not only the investment that they'd made already, that was now worth zero, but it, that all of that money and time they'd spent had now become negative. It had become a sunk cost that now was just sitting there around their neck like a, like a millstone. So very, very expensive, very painful to see that massive loss just happen in the blink of an eye with one piece of uh, damning research. So this was lesson one. It's really painful and expensive to kill your dog. It feels expensive, even though it's actually 
if we could kill them, we'd be saving money. It feels like we've just burned a load of money when we say no to a project that otherwise we, we believe is, is going to work. So it's painful to kill your darling. That was the first lesson I needed to figure out. And, and on that note, I think there's an ability down in the down in the bottom somewhere to raise your hand, um, sort of poke your hand up if you've experienced this. If, if you had conversations with your team or your company, could we, we, we wish we could kill these ideas sooner before we've invested so much time. Yep, seeing some hands going up. Good, yeah, a little a good few ticks there. Oh, a tick and a thumbs up, yeah. Everyone's, everyone's, I think a lot of people have had these conversations, but it's still, it remains hard, doesn't it? Uh, and I was also wrong because it, it, it's really hard for research to do this because research is coming in at this stage. It feels like this. It feels like a bureaucratic person coming in and telling you, you can't do the thing that you wanted to do because computer or in this case, researcher says no. Uh, and this, this is the other lesson I had to learn. When research plays at this gatekeeper role, it doesn't get more influence. We, the researchers, don't influence the company to change. We get sidelined. We get put in safe places where we can't break the project and we can't derail the train and the, the train has to keep rolling. So this wasn't working. So I thought, OK, well, let's use research to help you get the outcomes. That's going to be good. We can we can figure out what outcomes you want and we can use research to get you those outcomes. Fantastic. This this should work. And the problem I found was it's really hard to get crispy about outcomes. People, I, I was working with multiple teams trying to get them to figure out, what, to just decide on what outcomes they were chasing, working with the C-suite, the, the senior leadership team. Can we be clear about what outcomes we're trying to chase so that the teams can then work towards them? And one of the things that, that is challenging for teams and CEOs is, yeah, but we kind of want to do this thing. And what if we set outcomes and then it shows up that the thing isn't the best way to get those outcomes and, and we're going to have to not do the thing that I want to do. I, I don't want to do that. So it becomes a game of trying to, I, I found people gaming the outcomes almost, trying to tweak them so that people would do what they wanted them to do in the first place. It, it, it wasn't working. So what happens is the company focused more on operations because of all these three things. What the company does is get much better at planning, building and launching when they planned to launch. And this has some, some benefits, but we still don't know what actually worked or not in a lot of cases. And the, the outcomes are gradually disappearing into the distance and not, not becoming something that we care about until sometime it, it all crashes and burns and we need to, we need to worry. Um, this, is, this is the challenge that I was up against. Outcomes with most of the teams I work with and even with myself, they felt difficult and fuzzy and out of our control. Whereas the ideas we have are concrete, and they're simple, and they're under our control. We can we can touch them and do them and make them happen. And uh, these these were the really the, the biggest challenges uh, to to working in a, in a in a different way. So these were the three lessons. It's painful to kill ideas. Research makes for a bad gatekeeper, and it's too hard to start with outcomes. So what do we do? I'm, I'm going to go on now to what finally worked, and it was something where I had to have this realization. And this is something that as a researcher, as a designer, I know that we need to do for our users. If we're going to make a product that we want people to use and we want to change their behavior, well, this is where we have to start. I hadn't quite been extending that to my teams and companies. This is a, a common thing in the UX world is that we have this sort of hypocrisy where we are extraordinarily empathic towards the customers and yet fail to extend the same empathy towards the people we work with who are in the same building as us or not anymore on the same Zoom call as us these days. Um, so I had to understand this. And most people, most of the time, want to see a plan to get their idea done. And that's just the, the place they're going to start. And so I had to do a bit of jujitsu, roll with the punch, and then, and then work from there. Um, we start with the idea and we make a plan. But there's one little twist. We're going to make the plan using this acronym, if BS, stop which is a clue to what you're going to do if it turns out the plan was BS. And it also is a handy acronym that tells you the steps of the process that get you across from your idea to the uh, outcomes you're, you're worried about. So let's break this down one step at a time. We'll start with the I of FBS. Stop. This stands for initiative. And we are imagining 
uh, this is this is where we do some time travel with the whole team. So we get the whole team together, potentially stakeholders as well, and we do a bit of time travel. We say it's six months after launch, and the initiative worked better than we could have thought, better than we hoped. What does the world look like? What's the good world and possibly good world that we, we could be in? We don't stop there, though. We then time travel again, but this time to an alternate reality, the world of failure, the F. This time, and the framing of this question turns out to be quite important. It's six months after launch, and the initiative failed so badly, we wish, we wish we'd never even started it. What does the world look like? And now we're going to describe what that world looks like and talk about that world. This is great. So now with these, we're looking at a range of possible worlds that we might end up in. And this is a much more uh, helpful way, I found, to think about the future than to try and set targets that you just pull out of your ass and, uh, and need to just, somebody just sets an arbitrary target and then we have to chase after it. So this gives us a range of possibilities for the future, but we don't stop there. Often teams stop after that pre-mortem and then don't turn it into something that's actionable. They just put the, put the sticky notes away and then leave it and it's never, never see it again. So we're going to do a next step, which is behaviours. So now we're going to jump into that good future and the bad future, and we're going to describe the behaviours that we will see in the world that people will be doing. And that could be our customers, it could be our, uh, our own employees, or it could be our competitors. It, the behaviours that we're going to see in these different worlds, what are they going to be? And we get quite crispy about that. We get describe them quite fully. But we don't stop there. Now we're going to turn. Now we're going to think about which of those behaviours in that future world could we see earlier? And are there any behaviours that we could provoke or that we could, we might start seeing a lot sooner? And this is, this is the point where we can start thinking about, oh, it's experimentation. So if one sort of classic example is, if we're thinking that in the perfect world, this, our, our new product idea will be flying off the shelves and people will, will absolutely love it. Well, why don't we do a, a little test sale page to see if people are buying it when it doesn't exist yet, a sort of a smoke test uh, or a prototype, as it's called. Uh, and we could do that today, this week. Uh, another one that so Peter is suggesting looking at leading indicators. Exactly. So what we're trying to do is take the, the very lagging stuff, which is the business impact, like we're going to have sales, we're going to reduce our churn, et cetera, et cetera. And we're turning it into what behaviors, what outcomes could we see in the very short term? Uh, sometimes it can be as quick as today. We can send an email out to a few customers or a few prospects to see if they're interested to talk to us about a problem, to see if the problem is real. And if nobody's interested in talking to us, well, it's probably not that real or important. So maybe we move on to something else. And that's the, that's the, the key to these sorts of things. What behaviours will we see in the good world and the bad world? But we don't stop there. We're now going to turn those behaviours into signals. What signals will we see if those behaviors are happening. These are now the ways that we can detect these behaviors. Uh, and this is the way to get from, from uh, sort of random descriptions of the world to outcomes. Outcomes are user behaviors that we're able to measure. And now we've got a whole load of things we can measure. But we don't stop there. For each of these uh, outcomes that we're getting to, there's going to be a minimum point which is now marked on the right-hand one, where it's, it's worth doing. It has been worth the investment of time, attention, and money that our team has put into this, this thing. And it goes beyond that because actually there's a minimum point of worth it all the way back down. So these are the triggers that we're going to set. And that's like the line of minimum worth itness. It, it was worth doing this to get these behaviors to happen in the world. It, it's telling us that we're on the right track. So... We don't stop there. Um, so this is what we, we, we're now going to frame these in a really clear format. Uh, and we're going to say this is setting our triggers and becoming open about them. We're going to say if we don't see signal A above trigger point X by the end of this week, we're going to pivot. We're going to change what we do. We, we might kill the whole thing entirely or we might just change some things depending on what the signals are that we're seeing, depending on what we want to do. But we're going to make sure we stop and have a think if things are not looking the way we thought they were going to look because it's a signal that something's wrong with what we're trying to do. Uh, and we're going to put those together and we're going to have a bunch of these in a, in, a, in a sheet, in a document, some sort of document. And we can use this to have conversations with the senior stakeholders, with our colleagues on other teams. We can publish this within the company and be really, really clear about what we're trying to achieve 
and what the boundaries are where we're going to think actually that's not working well enough for us we're going to stop and we're going to think again and we can have some really good and i've seen just a different sort of conversation happening from framing it in this way and, and making this thing really really simple and uh, public but we don't stop there we have to persist if we just set them and forget them nothing's going to change so i think uh, so so the thing we're going to do now is persist and these are all some of the things we did we published them in our intranet which was in notion we wrote them into the roadmap specific explicitly so when the roadmap for our our team was there it was, it was written with the pivot triggers right there in in the the, the slide about it we'd revisit it every time we were doing our sprint planning uh, we'd put it on the wall in retros we'd talk about it in the retros and we'd uh, talk about this but the product manager was talking through all of the pivot triggers in the company all hands and in the portfolio reviews and, and any time that we were talking about our product we were talking about our pivot triggers and the, the question to think about is where will your stakeholders be when they need a reminder and your stakeholders might be the senior leaders or other other teams etc etc uh, and that's that's what we're going to think about so there we go that's your your handy dandy little uh, rubric if bs stop that's your initiative, failure, behaviours, then you sequence the behaviours, you look for the signals, you set your triggers, you open it up and have that negotiation about have you set the right triggers, have you set the right levels for them, and then you persist and you keep looking at these over time. I'm going to give an example of how this worked. So this is in 2020, a team had a plan. And the plan was to, to, to launch basically a product feature, a new sort of product capability. And we were going to use AI, which we were good at, to create a report, which we were good at making, that would help our customers, who were people working in e-commerce, uh, on e-commerce teams, to focus on the right bits of their catalogs. Some of these catalogs are tens, hundreds of thousands of products big. And so you can't look at all of that all the time. You have to focus in and pick some things. And all of our customers we talked to were worried that they were missing some of the parts. Uh, that, so missing some ideas that mattered, missing some products that were not performing as well as they should, and missing some products that were performing better than they, better than they thought, but weren't getting some, enough exposure. So lots of little details, things they didn't know where to focus, and this would help them to make better decisions. And we thought this is going to be great. We know how to do this. We know that there's a need here. People have have seen that there's a there's a there's a problem, and, and they're feeling that pain. Now. The company I was working with had tried a similar idea before. This was a few years back, and it was something about creating an exciting dashboard that would give people uh, analytics insights and, and the ability to know what was going on. And can we guess how that went? So the last time they tried this, it had not been very pretty. And the thing was still sitting there in the platform, just nobody clicked into it, nobody used it. It was, it was languishing, a bit, of, a bit of zombie functionality. So this time, we did it differently we set pivot triggers. So we had our uh, cone of possibilities, we set our line of still worth doing, and we set little moments when we were going to check in and see, is this going the way we thought? And we started with a prototype that we all loved, but the users said, nah, that's not it. We checked this straight away, the users, bang, we put their real data in, thought it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it looked really cool, and the users didn't like it, couldn't make a heads or tail of it, it was, it was useless. Great, so we pivoted. And instead, we worked on the team's first ever real MVP. So from forming the team to getting the first MVP out was eight days, um, which was much better than the previous attempt. Uh, and this was, it was rough and ready. We didn't write polished code. We didn't do polished designs. This was literally a Google sheet and we emailed it to some customers and to see how they would get on with it. Uh, and we were able to, to track some of the things about them. We were able to have conversations with our customers. And suddenly we started hitting uh, signals that were above our pivot triggers. And this was looking good. Now, at this point, we were able to iterate this further and it, it went up and down a bit. There was some, some noise in there and a bit of, bit of movement, but we, we kept this going and it was looking really, really promising. At which point we thought, hmm, this could be even better than we thought. This could be something different. We could change what we're doing and make for a new product feature here, which, which would be even more powerful, even more exciting. So we set our new pivot triggers and we talked to the leadership team. And they said, actually, we want you to stick with the thing that you were doing before. Uh, we like this idea, but it's not for now. So we're going to pause that. And we were like, OK, not, not a problem. So we went back to that. It was cool. And we carried on. 
And there were little bumps as we iterated and learned. But over time, we we stayed above that line as we as we the pivoting let us stay above that line and keep making the decisions that we're, we're going to make this work and drive the behaviors we wanted to see, get the outcomes we were hoping to get. Um, so what I discovered was that we take our three learnings and flip them on their head. So it was no longer painful to kill ideas. The teams and stakeholders had agreed to experiment early and had agreed, as, uh, as Dorian said, going in from the start with the idea that things might change. Exactly. And that's what I saw the, the, the engineers then doing. They didn't uh, make huge technical architecture decisions and uh, like gold plate all of the code and, and make something that was really, really brilliantly written. They hacked it together roughly. And then every time we had an iteration each week, they would just slightly improve the bits that were, were getting more stable, that, that seemed to be working regularly, and, and that would get better and better over time. Uh, instead of research being a bad gatekeeper and saying no, instead, the whole team was discovering and delivering together. We'd all agreed what we were looking for and how we'd be measuring it. And we'd all agreed that if we weren't seeing the right signals, we might change. And so everybody was on board with the, the same idea. And Instead of starting with outcomes and trying to force people to think that way around, we started with the ideas and we used these set of workshops to build a bridge that took us to the outcomes. And it made all the difference in the world. So is this now broken? No, there we go. Uh, so how can you try pivot triggers with your own teams? Uh, simple little thing we've got that you can read more at pivottriggers.com and then something that I would have made today if I wasn't finishing these slides was a, like a, an FBS stop worksheet, workshop cheat sheet that you can use to follow through with your teams and, and try it out. So if you sign up on my email list, then I, you'll be the first to get it. But otherwise, just you don't have to do that. Just keep checking and uh, I, I will uh, make sure I, I'll be shouting about it when it's available. Um, so that's all of that. There was one more thing that I wanted to touch on but I'm aware that we have now gone for at least 20 minutes. So what do you think, Alexi? Should we finish off the last bit? Yeah, I mean, now I want to know it, so. <laughs> <laughs> ah, my ahead. cunning plan worked. Yeah. Uh, cool, so this is where we jump into the idea of uh, loopishness and what, what that means. So this is about discovery, delivery, and loopishness. And one of the things that I, I realized through, through doing this was I worked with a team who actually iterated and were comfortable iterating. And the thing that's hard about iteration, the thing that's hard about discovery is that you are wrong all the time and you feel wrong all the time because you're always coming up against, nope, 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 didn't get it right until something starts to work in the end, hopefully, if you're lucky. Um, and this is... Uh, an insight from Scott Birkin in his book, How Design Makes the World. And he, he noted that most people just love, love to jump directly to solving things and they want to make a linear schedule. That's comfortable. You have a linear plan, you follow the plan and it works. And loops just don't fit into that. This idea of iteration, the idea that we're going to make the plan, but then we're going to throw the plan away after a week and make a new plan. Well, it, it doesn't seem right. How do we know when it's going to finish? It's, it's really stressful to people. Um, so. I, I'm guessing that most people are familiar with the idea of dual track discovery and delivery, and this idea that we're going to do a bunch of discovery, and then we throw it over and it goes into delivery. And this, this tends to be the way that this can happen. And you get this, uh, the problem with this is you've got discovery in there, you've got research in there, but it's still linear. And by the time you've delivered the thing at the end, that's only one loop from all that discovery to the delivery. You, you're only looking at one loop there. You've, done, you've tried one idea and then you've got the results of that idea. And if it didn't work, we have to go right back to the start and start again or just leave it, move on to something else, as most people are probably familiar with. So the difference with pivot triggers is that we're discovering and delivering together and the whole team are involved in this for the whole time. It's just that we mix, uh, we, we blend the, the balance of how much discovery versus delivery we're doing over time as we iterate. And each iterate becomes a loop into discovery, through discovery and delivery. And we do as many of these loops as we can fit in. The secret is to iterate as many times as possible and really learn. Uh, and there's a huge difference here between iteration where you're uh, basically destroying and recreating your mental model of how the thing should work and what the world is like 
on it with every iteration versus incrementality where you have one big idea but you break it down into small chunks or sprints and then you deliver those sprints um, so most agile that i've seen just to end on a on an inflammatory note tends to be a waterfall project but with 10 sprints in the middle um, and so with this way of uh, becoming more loopish this enables us to actually live the idea of thinking big starting small and learning fast and that is the secret of pivot triggers so with that, thank you all very much for your uh, very patient attention. Uh, it was really a pleasure to share this. I'm wondering if anyone has any any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Tom. So please, everyone, um, feel free to, to ask any question. Also, if you're watching on YouTube or, or on Facebook or any other platform, you can just post a question there and, and we'll read it. So don't feel shy. So we have... One question from Peter. How early do you set the triggers? That is a, a an extremely good question and very important. Uh, the earliness, as you can see from the idea of the sunk cost, the earlier you can set them, the better. Um, so in the very best cases, I think ideally you want to do this uh, before you've even started the initiative. So when you're at the stage of planning, somebody has an idea and you're trying to plan that idea, Usually there is a, in a lot of companies, I think there tends to be a sort of a, a pipeline of ideas being thought about um, strategically before they're uh, actually put on a team's plate. So once the team is thinking about how do we do this idea, that is uh, it, the moment when they get that idea is probably the, the time when they're most likely to, to be able to start setting those pivot triggers. But at the beginning of the project, when you're figuring out what are we gonna do, how are we gonna do it together, you can set your pivot triggers right then. I found that that works quite well. Um, so then, uh, how early? So yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, just to finish that off, I have tried to use them a little bit later in the process, but the later you wait while there's sunk costs going in, the harder it is then to be able to kill the idea if it didn't work out. Um, you're sort of you're trying to retrofit something in a sense it can be more tricky like that so it's probably better to start it with something that's brand new and you're starting fresh at the start of a new cycle feature idea product etc um, any tricks for getting buy-in for using this method so with the team that i was working with um, basically it was uh, guiding them through using the workshops as a way of saying, look, we're just doing a pre-mortem. Okay, look, we're just gonna do this. We're, do we're just doing the workshops in a way where they don't need to know, or they didn't need to know really that we we're gonna end up with these pivot triggers in this way of working. And it sort of incepted the idea along the way, I think that, uh, oh yeah, of course, we we're gonna be experimenting and we're gonna learn whether it's worth carrying on. Um, the thing, one thing that I didn't mention in the, in the, during the talk is some of the pivot triggers that we were using were to do with say desirability usability things to do with like the demand side do customers even want this is it meeting their needs is it helping them with their pains etc but some of the the things were to do with viability and feasibility so can we even build this and some of the the pivot triggers we set were about doing technical spikes so everyone can be involved and, and about uh, with the data scientists they were looking at the quality of the data can we actually get the insights we wanted out of this can we get the, the things we need from the data sets that we have uh, so and they would set uh, minimum levels of what, what amount of, you know, for, for how, what percentage of customers should we be able to easily get the information we want out of their data? And if it's less than 60% of customers, well, do we need to think again? Uh, or if it's more than 60%, great, we're, we're happy with that. And we could have those conversations. So it worked for everyone on the team um, equally, equally well. In terms of getting buy-in, uh, what I've found is so far, haven't needed to get buy-in from the stakeholders explicitly up front to start doing this you can do this with a team and then when you take your little set of pivot triggers to the stakeholders to the senior leaders whoever it is who's, who's sponsoring the, the the team and the project you're automatically getting them bought into thinking in a slightly different way and you're you're opening up a new sort of conversation where you you're no longer talking about what should we be doing you've started talking much more their language, which is what's it worth us doing? 
at what point is it not worth continuing with this at what point is it worth continuing with this and uh, one senior leader um actually told me that he he really enjoyed it because normally when you ask some when he asked his his array of different product managers how important their particular product was or their particular project was everyone obviously thought theirs was really important and it was definitely not a good one to kill and it was definitely higher priority than everybody else's and everybody thought that the same and so this is a way of of getting a bit uh, a bit more of an objective view he th he felt over the the portfolio of, of projects and, and teams that that were working um so it, it i haven't found it hard to get buy-in whereas if you lead with we need to do research that's extraordinarily hard to get by um so let's see next one do you try and to we have one from andrew yeah good do you try to set targets for the lengths of these iterations uh yes so um this is something i left out of this particular talk but uh there's a really helpful framework for time scales from uh, john cutler which is the one to three scale so you can go from one to three hours if you go beyond one to three hours then really you're at the day stage and then one to three days if you go beyond one to three days you're at the week stage if you go beyond one to three weeks, well, really, you're now in months. If you go beyond one to three months, you're in quarters, one to three quarters. Beyond that, you're in a year. And it, it sort of goes like that. Um, so I, I tend to group the behaviors into those sorts of chunks, which gives you this kind of fractal nature. At the start, you're looking for very fast, very small, weak signals. And so you want to try, most teams I've worked with on this don't realize that they can experiment much, much earlier than they thought. They wait far too long to experiment. And most teams that I've worked with could actually do an experiment right there and then within one to three hours and get results within one to three days that help them to make better decisions. But they were thinking originally that it would take like a month and they'd have to build a load of stuff. And so the, that behaviors and sequences step was a really helpful way to, to try and set those pivot triggers, uh, to, to, to set those experiments much, much faster. Um, targets for the length of the iterations. So you're going to have a natural cadence in your team for whatever your time box is for a sprint or a whatever your sort of unit is. So sprints are often two weeks. Uh, the team I've worked with before, we were doing it on one weeks, but the one week sprints, but they can be quite uh, tiring. Once things settled down and the, the, the rate of change slowed down, they moved to two week sprints because that was more comfortable. So I'd say something around that, a sort of two week cycle is, is quite good for an iteration. Um, the faster you can go, the more iterations you can pack in to any given time frame, the faster you'll learn and the, the further you'll get. Uh, so it's really about iterations. Uh, the, the secret to everything is just iterations, more iterations. Um, but yeah, so as you can see from that time scale thing, really what you're looking for is to do very quick uh, experiments up front, and then you're going to get gradually longer as it goes into the future because you don't know much about the future at this stage. As you as we move through the the, the projects. Uh, the project I talked about there, we kept setting uh, new pivot triggers, new experiments that we could run within a week or two, and then we'd set further out ones as well, and we'd keep track of all of those. Um, so that's it. Yeah, Tom, if I may. Yeah. <laughs> so first off, thanks for the talk. A very intriguing topic. I haven't heard of that before. Um, I was curious, for, from your experience, what kind of maturity should an organization have? Um, to try this, let's say, concept or, or tool, because from what I from what I understood, it's quite complex. You know, even though it's of course the acronym is simple and it's easy to follow. Let's say your presentation, I I can imagine that an organization, both from engineering point of view and also from the product side of things and the business overall, needs to have a quite high maturity to be able to use such a tool and work with that. So many organizations are not even you know, thinking about dual track agile yet, for example. So do you have some thoughts on that maybe already? Um, it's a tricky one. And I will admit, I haven't yet tried it in a, in a company which does have like a really low um, maturity. Um, I, I'm keen to do so though. I can't see that it's gonna hurt. Um, what you're doing is starting to have conversations about the fact that things might not work out the way you thought. And I think everybody kind of knows that in their gut. And everyone I've talked to about roadmaps kind of say, it says, pays lip service to the idea that we know the roadmap will probably change. 
and yet they still want a roadmap and they still treat it as if it's rock solid, locked in. This is locked. It's a lock. We're going to do it and we're going to lock the design and then build it and it's going to be brilliant. And then they know that they've seen it fail. They've seen it go wrong. But it's very hard to start having those conversations about doing it differently. Um, I, I, I'd like to think this might be a way that we could start those conversations. I'm not sure that it would, would work. It might terrify people. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is explaining it conceptually to you. It looks really complicated because it's got these graphs and sort of things and, and ideas. Taking people through it in a workshop, it actually wasn't difficult. Um, the, the steps all follow on, followed on naturally from one to the next. And before we knew it, we'd, we'd actually agreed a set of outcomes that were like, yeah, OK, that seems fair. And everyone knew what they could do. We could see what experiments we all needed to do. And what was really important, everyone on the team knew that we had stakeholder buy-in to be able to stop doing something if it wasn't working, because we'd shared this with the senior leadership team and they'd said, yep, that sounds good. You go for that. And we're behind you if you need to, if you need to pivot. Um, so that, that I think that worked. Uh, cool. A, a great question from Katie Fricks. Yeah, we have a question from YouTube that we haven't answered yet. You don't see it because it's not in the chat, if you don't mind. Cool, uh, yeah. So it's, how do you choose a signal independent of the level of fidelity of your prototype? That is a confusing question. <laughs> um, um, so, so, yeah, maybe we can ask for more details. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's get more details. What What are the, uh -huh. What is this person concerned about? Yeah, so if she's uh, still online, uh, send us some some more some follow up, and we'll, we'll go back to this one. Cool, sounds good. And then I'll I'll just pull. Yeah, Katie Fricks, thanks for your question. Uh, if focused solely on results, how do we present prevent accessibility from falling to the wayside? My take on this is accessibility is one of the things we care about as a product team. And so there's nothing to stop a certain level of accessibility being one of our pivot triggers. Um, one of the things that I've talked about a lot before, uh, there's a, an old article I wrote and a talk I gave, which is A-B testing ain't for settling your disagreements. And my basic sort of point in that is most teams, most of the time, haven't had a proper conversation about what better is, what we're actually trying to achieve, what outcomes we want to get in the world. We haven't thought about what, uh, we haven't all agreed on that, and we all have different implicit ideas about what that is. So what I can see happening on many teams is you've got a designer sat over here who cares about accessibility and usability and uh, making the, the, the colors work properly and whatever other things like that. You've got a developer over here who cares about uh, having the code being very clean and maintainable, uh, working in a language that they're comfortable in, having a good system architecture, all those sorts of things. You've got a data scientist over here who cares about the cleanliness of the data. And none of them are having a conversation about what better means to them and what better is going to mean to all of us as a team. So I would think uh, like one of the things that, that could happen in your Pivot Triggers workshop, if you are the designer and you're, you, you know, accessibility is, is important, which of course it is, then one of the things that would happen in the terrible world is this is not accessible and people can't use it. Uh, you know, people, people who need accessible websites can't use the thing. And that's a, that's a bad thing. And what behaviors will we see? Well, we can start to think about how we detect those behaviors and we can start to track those. And suddenly you've got a way of, of actually m measuring something which previously might not be measured by your company. Um, and this is another thing that I saw with a lot of teams who were trying to jump to outcomes first. They would start with, well, what can we already measure? And that, I suspect, is what's behind your concern, Katie, is this sort of focus solely on results. We tend to then think about the results that we're already measuring, the sort of business results, the business impact type stuff. And we, we don't take the time or, or do the thinking, do the work, which is really difficult and complex, of understanding how our user behaviors are going to lead to those business results. Um, and accessibility is definitely one of those things. Does that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Um, cool. A really interesting question from John Grant of how can a culture of pivoting too often or too soon be mitigated? It's a really interesting question. I don't think I've been in one of those. Um, but I do understand that you can sometimes get a sense of like thrashing 
and they're just sort of thrashing around looking for something that works just trying all sorts of things is that the sort of thing you're thinking about john um possibly but i also think or i've read or i heard somebody comment that you, the opportunities can be lost by pivoting too soon so if there's a way to be able to package branches up and then revisit them at a later date that may be one way of mitigating the, that kind of culture but i don't know ah uh, yeah no that makes sense so a sense of it, i'm hearing in that there's something of the sense of uh, certain ideas have a time and if you're too early with an idea then it might not get the signals that you were hoping for and you might think therefore it's a bad idea where actually it's a good idea but just just six months early and maybe you'll see later that, that it's possible to pull that out again so that sort of thing uh, i didn't think of that one actually yes so there's possibly a year ahead of time uh, but also actually just pivoting too early and there's nothing then to stop uh, a partner an employee walking away and continuing that branch um, that's my concern is that, that there must be a balance to be struck between pivoting because it makes economic sense and because of time constraints, but also pivoting and, um, and not destroying uh, serendipity. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. I, so, I mean, from my experience with this, I found it helped us with serendipity. Um, because one of the things I've noticed, one of the things that, that's been frustrating on some projects in the past are those, those ones that go on forever, zombie initiatives, and you've got a plan and you stick to the plan. And at no point, halfway through the plan, you're like, oh my God, this could be something so much better if we'd thought about this earlier. That always happens. Like, oh my God, we could have done this differently. If we'd known this earlier on, we would have done this totally differently. And those moments are the ones I think that are really important in terms of serendipity. What I've seen so far is we're, we're trying to pull that, that serendipity forwards in the process. Um, and it's important to note, I think, and it's probably not clear enough from this, when I'm saying like pivot triggers here, when we're doing a pivot, when it's below the level where it's like it's worth continuing as we are, we don't necessarily have to do a complete full pivot. It can be like quite a micro pivot. It can be, ah, the language isn't working in the email we sent out and we, we realized that we're not talking to the customer's pain point quite well enough and maybe if we change that it's going to work better let's try that and then did that work or not but it's going to help us to improve things along the way potentially or we might see signals that say oh my god we didn't realize that this is this just isn't a real problem in the world nobody's going to care about this at all it's better if we kill this off now so it's not a sort of a it's not an automated process where you get to this point and you see the signals aren't matching the, the trigger points and you just go right kill everything that's it it's dead stamp it it's it's a it's a moment when you're going to stop and think and say actually do we want to continue and if we're going to continue how are we going to continue what are we going to do differently are we going to change anything do we need to change anything could we change what this is going to be could we we spot this new opportunity should we just shift what we're trying to do and, and pivot to, to take advantage of some serendipity or should we carry on um, so I see it that way, I think. Um, I think you're much done. Uh, being a bit conscious of the time, I think we're going to take the last question because it's already 7.20. And I think it's, it's uh, in the order. It will be from Peter. Cool. Yeah. So that is, it sounds like pivot triggers are a good way to execute on the last steps of the Lean UX canvas. Have you tried combining both exercises? So... The Lean UX canvas, I, there are so many canvases, I can't remember which one that is. Can you remind me of that one? It's, it's the one by uh, Josh Seiden and Jeff Gothelf, uh, which talks about uh, user benefits, company benefits, and then slowly moves into user behaviors that you want to see, and then goes into experiments to figure out whether uh, what you need to build to see those behaviors and start measuring them. Um, ah, so it's, cool. it's yeah, really yeah. like step, step six, seven, and eight of their eight-step uh, canvas. Um, 
for later, I guess. Yeah, no, I think that's good. I, I, I am familiar with that one now. Um, now it feels like, well, what I've kind of done here is sort of flesh out those step six and an eight into eight steps. <laughs> Could be, yes. Uh, but I think the thing is, I've tried that lean UX canvas before and that way of, I've been in companies where the, 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 somebody has said to me, basically, slightly paraphrased, but yes, we love experimenting. We want to do experiments, of course, but can you just put all the experiments in a spreadsheet and tell us which ones are going to work best so we can do those ones first and not do the ones that won't work? And it's, <laughs> it, it's just, it's difficult to have that conversation better. Yes. Uh, yes, I think what you introduce is the, the rigor around experiments and when to call one quits and when to continue with another one uh, and stuff like that, yeah. Oh, I love that point, yeah. I think that's it. It's, it's setting up front before we start the experiment what the boundary is of where we where it's a success and a failure as an experiment rather than let's experiment and then we get to the end of the world is that good i don't know let's carry on yeah and uh, speaking of let's carry on i think it's time to let everybody move on to their evening now uh so thank you ever so much everybody it's been a real joy to share this and thank you to product people for hosting well, thank you very much, um, Tom. I think seeing all these questions, I think that the, the talk was pretty much uh, appreciated. So thank you very much. And so I guess uh, seven minutes, I guess we won't have time to go on to a networking session. So I think we just um, probably just stop here. <laughs> um, again, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you everyone for joining and for all your questions. Uh, I think we all learned a lot today from this uh, this canvas that was presented. Again, I'd like to repeat myself, but please feel free to join us uh, on the next meetings, the next meetups coming up um, every Tuesday. So uh, you can check the, the meetup page of Product People and you will find us there. Um, the Telegram chat is also there. You can ask all this canvas question you would <laughs> you'd like to. We'll be happy to, to dig into it. And again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Tom. And I hope we'll see you all uh, next week and the weeks coming. Thank you. I have Just uh, first about the, the voter recording. We'll yeah, I was about to so. tell you, Daniel, no worries. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, so it would be there like as soon as the, the platform processes the stream, ah, okay. you, will, you will be able to find it uh, on the YouTube page. Is it also just Product People YouTube channel I can find? Ah, okay. Yes, it is. I found the link on the meetup. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. Have very a much. great one. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Have a good one. All right. Are we still live, Clay? Oh, that's good.